Hey guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have James Hoffman back on the show. It's been a while since we've chatted, and I wanted to just catch up with him and also dig into something that he's been having his thoughts pivot on recently, which is the recovery strategies, and that is towards stress management and how important stress management is and what are some of the things that James recommends you can do in your day-to-day to make you manage stress better and therefore get more out of your training, get more out of your diet, all of that basically grow more muscle, lose more fat by managing stress better. But before we dive into that, we actually dig into what James has been up to personally with his own training and nutrition, and actually some really interesting insights into the fact that James has gone on to testosterone replacement therapy, what that's been like, why he did it, and maybe some thoughts behind whether or not you might want to go there someday, or maybe you don't. It was a really interesting discussion and James was really honest and open about things and I always appreciate that and I think it was very useful for anyone who's thinking about TRT in future to kind of hear that discussion. So definitely tune into that. And as a reminder guys, at Revive Stronger, we are online coaches. What we do is help people maximize their physique results and also educate them at the same time. We make ourselves available for lots of communication so we can answer your questions, make sure you fully understand things. So when you do eventually leave the nest, you take on your own training nutrition for yourself, you have all the skills at hand to be able to maximize your own results in the long run. And also you develop a skill set so you can help if you do have clients or you want to get into coaching, you have developed that skill set. You have a fantastic understanding of not only the principles, but how they apply in practice too. So if you are interested in online coaching, you can apply for that within the description. We'll have a link that will give you more information. Let's get into a word from our sponsor before we dig into the show. Guys, have you heard of blood flow restriction training, maybe BFR or occlusion training or even katsu training? It was first introduced by Dr. Sato in the 1960s. And since the 1990s, there's been hundreds of peer reviewed papers that have come out to show the efficacy for muscle hypertrophy and other means, and also the safety of it. And essentially what you can do is occlude a muscle so you can wrap it, tie it up, train it with really light loads, as little as 20% of your one rep max, and get equal hypertrophy to your traditional moderate to heavy weight training that we typically do. And so the bottom line is you can use light loads, generate lots of hypertrophy just like we can with heavier loads. Now, personally, I have experimented with BFR multiple times, but I had been put off by it for a long time because the pieces of equipment out there on the market just weren't very suitable. I'd use tourniquets. They were just a bit too thin and flimsy to really occlude my arms properly. I used uh, knee wraps to try and occlude my legs and they just lacked standardization and were really cumbersome and not very comfortable. And so this is where Saga Fitness come in with their BFR cuffs. They are perfectly sized, they fit supremely well, they're actually very comfortable. And then you can actually use their mobile app to select the pressure perfectly and standardize that every single time. And these have just been a complete game changer for BFR training for me. And they reminded me of the the pain and joy of uh, blood flow restriction training. So the way I would use blood flow restriction training with myself and my clients is first of all, just for some variation and novelty. There is nothing quite like a pump that is generated through occluding a muscle and then training it for multiple sets. I would also use it in scenarios where I particularly wanted to generate a lot of cell swelling or metabolites. And then finally, a really obvious one, but an important one is the fact that you can use such light loads. So if you do have any niggles or injuries across your physique, you can occlude the muscle and use really light loads, which will probably take pressure off those joints and connective tissue, allow you to still train the muscle and generate hypertrophy in a condition where otherwise you might not be able to. So if this sounds something that might be interesting to you that you wanna try, it comes highly recommended for myself having tried it. And I think the guys at Saga are doing fantastic work. You can actually get a exclusive discount with the code revive stronger all you need to do is head to saga.fitness and you can go and use that code get 20 percent off and uh, enjoy some gnarly gnarly bfr training and without further ado let's get into the chat with james hoffman Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall, and today I have James Hoffman back on the show. I don't know if you remember the last time you were on, James, but it was 10 months ago. Time just, I I always say this with guests, I check. Time flies. Holy cow. Yeah, October last year, and I mean, that's closely coming through now. (laughs) I was honestly thinking, I was like, oh, I was just on Steve's show like three or four months ago, but apparently not. Apparently, (laughs) there was a lot longer than that. And last time I kind of asked you kind of what was up with yourself and we spoke a little bit about your sciatica pain. 
I don't know if that's ah. something that's still around, if you've learned anything new about it, because I even was, pro I like, obviously when guests come on, I stalk their Instagram to see if there's anything interesting to kind of bring up. And I saw some people ask you questions about it. So it looks like it's still something you're having to deal with. Yeah, it's just something I, I manage a lot better now. I, uh, it was, it's one of those things where like when it flares up, it really fucking sucks and it just lingers around for a while. So it's more of an issue of like prevention. And so um, even just like silly things, like I don't sit with my wallet in my back pocket anymore. I wear like a butt pad in my car if I'm gonna be driving for a while or I might use like a lumbar support in my car. I don't, um, like I just don't blast. Uh, my legs quite as heavy. Like I don't do like, I'm a very strong deadlifter. And so that's typically any of the deadlift variations are good movements for me, but like, I just don't blast them anymore because I know that that is something that's going to lead to that sciatica issue. And even squats too, I have to kind of like, I can do, I can do some decent amount of squatting heavy, but I still have to just kind of like keep my volumes in check. So I do find myself kind of doing these more like beach boy workouts where I might do like some squats and then it's like leg extensions, hamstring curls. And I try to make it better with like using mile reps or some sissy squats or belt squats or lunges, things like that. That's fine. But like, I've gotten away from a lot of the like heavy pulling, super, super, super heavy squatting. And it, that seems to work really, really well. And then just kind of being conscious of it, not, not sitting for huge amounts of time not allowing myself to get really stiff I, I really work on stretching out like a lot of the different angles on my glutes um hitting some of those psoas stretches that seems to help a lot just keeping it like at bay that's yeah that makes a ton of sense i think yeah people always say or, or the saying is for like hypertrophy is a very forgiving adaptation if you're a power lifter then you're a bit screwed because you're like well i have to do these lifts and you'd probably have to like be very careful about periodizing them and just put them in for as long to get the technique or something i'm not sure but uh, i know i've heard some power lifters talk about it where those are the lifts that like just like they're a low bar squatter in competition but that specific lift is the one that causes them all the problems so they do high bar most of the time and then just introduce it very short term as they're peaking or something but like you said you can do worst, so much right because if you're a power lifter, you have no choice. And at that point, it's just all about like injury and pain management. And like, you just have to kind of deal with it or find a new hobby, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> like powerlifting, weightlifting, like, God, that must suck. At least with like, you know, I'm not a bodybuilder by any means, but if you're just training to look jacked, like you can, you can find plenty of other things to do and they'll still check the same boxes. Yeah. And I guess axial loading kind of as a term, that was like some of the lifts that cause you problems, like the deadlifts uh the, the barbell back squat is there any lifts that you've kind of been more drawn to i know you were doing belt squats as an example i'm doing those at the moment uh, have you found those to be particularly helpful bell squats are good bell squats are very humbling if you dial in the like quad emphasize technique i i don't have particularly strong quads so i'm not moving tons of weight around i actually somebody uh on that bell squat video i posted i got a shit poster and the person was like fuck this guy. He's got weak quads. You should do like X, Y, and Z other things. And I actually just affirmed him. I was like, you're right. And then the follow-up was like, oh man, I'm sorry. That was me. <laughs> That's my new strategy when I get shit posters, just affirm whatever they're saying. You're right. Um, yeah. So the belt squats are good. You know, I see a lot of people doing them in like a very odd, like cantilevered, good morning squat hybrid. Um, but if you really focus on kind of like, if you if you use Dr. Mike as an example, you, most of you have seen his like very exaggerated upright squatting posture. And if you can adopt that kind of same idea on the belt squats, you can really put a lot of emphasis on the quads. So that's been a really, a really good one. And it reduces a lot of that axial loading too. Um, for me, like the lunge variations, whether they're lunges, you know, split squats, any, any of the like kind of single leg, not truly single leg, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Any of the like split leg kind of ones tend to work really, really well for me. And I've noticed that like when I keep those in, uh, my legs always just look much fuller and bigger. Like I have much more distinct, like quad hamstring separation. I just, they just look beefier when I have the, those, those lunge variations in the mix. I did have a problem though, where I, I ended up getting, uh, like bursitis in my knee. I, I was just sitting around watching TV and all of a sudden my knee is like the size of a melon. And I'm looking at it like, what, what just happened? Like I, nothing, nothing happened. Um, and I was trying to troubleshoot, like I didn't get injured. Like I didn't, nothing snapped or popped or I didn't, didn't feel any pain. It just all of a sudden my knee swollen. Uh, and then I narrowed down my choices. I was like, oh, I, I have bursitis. And it's probably from just the, either the impacts, uh, or the like friction of hitting all those lunges all the time of that knee contacting the ground. Um, and so I had to like back off of those for a little while, but the lunge variations have always been really good for me too. Um. And anything where anything where um, you're just not like in a super square stance and just loading hard, 
seems to be an, a good alternative, at least for me. That makes sense. Yeah, with the the belt squats. We've got a belt squat machine in our gym, which I, I adore because I've been using it for for squat patterns, but also for hip hinges, I really like it for as well. Yeah, that's true. Do you find that the setup on the hip hinge is kind of a pain in the ass though? That's the one where I, I, I think about doing it. And I'm like, God, I hate setting this up though. I haven't found it too troubling because it's easier to load than a barbell. And it's also less awkward to like unrack than like dumbbells out of a rack. And like, then you're like, ah, oh, both of these are really heavy and well, what am I doing here? So yeah. I haven't found it to be too much of a problem, but there's quite a difference in like belt squats from what I've heard. I haven't tried that many, but some people have messaged me being like, oh, I wish I had your belt squat because of X, Y, and Z. Whereas I'm like, oh, I haven't really tried that many different ones. They, they make them for people who are like 15 feet tall. I don't know who the fuck <laughs> is doing this, but every belt squat I've ever used, they have like, a super long chain they have the bottom like safety that sticks up like six inches um and like you can barely squat I, so i've always had to like take the chain out just connect right directly to the the pin take the bottom safeties out and elevate the platform and i'm not like a small guy i'm like six one right and I, even for me it's like i still have to elevate it i don't know who they are designing those for but it's like giant people yeah i think it's like a lot of equipment if someone just goes in and uses it as it's set up probably they're not going to get much out of it but i'm the same as you like i don't even think about like it's got a p extra clips and a chain and i'm like use the closest like hook on the belt itself use just the hook on the like to equip it to the um the, the lever and then i'm good and still like you i could probably do with adding like maybe half an inch or an inch of like padding under my heels and that would allow me to or not heels my full foot to get that depth yeah yeah i don't you know i don't know if there's like a huge difference amongst some of the other ones i think it's mostly kind of like cosmetic personal preference like if you what's the rogue one is it one of them's the pit shark rogue has one anyways some of them have like better handle set up some of them actually have where the, the 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 lever can drop down in between the platform um like there are some like some different ones but they get expensive real quick too like i know um they can start getting up into like the three thousand five thousand yeah. range and they have a humongous footprint that's the thing that sucks for like a home gym where it's like you know squat rack's pretty big but you can do a ton of stuff with it whereas the belt squat you do have a lot of options but i mean it's like you can squat you can maybe do some 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 hinge variations and maybe some like pulling variations but that's a lot of space for not a lot of stuff so it is yeah. kind of a, a, a nice add-on but definitely not like a, a necessity i would say yeah and the thing i was going to say with people performing on it and like you said like when you make it very quad emphasis you can't use that much load hip hinging you can actually use a lot of load on it especially because yes you have to have the lever quite far out which inevitably makes it like you can load it even heavier with that so you're not like headbutting the machine <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. as you come down <clears throat> at least uh, from my one uh, but yeah with the like you can have the lever quite short when you're doing the quad emphasis but so many people use all of that and then they get barely any depth whereas for me i'm like hey this is for people who struggle like it's kind of like a goblet squat but as a machine like goblet squats can be great for people to learn how to like sit deep into a squat this if you set up right you can go deeper than you ever could with like anything else i find oh totally yeah i, I love the, those machines um it is kind of like a love hate relationship sometimes because yeah. the things it is really good at some things and then kind of like meh at others it doesn't rub your thighs does it the belt like, as you're squatting down oh between um, your sometimes legs, yeah. i like i actually prefer like the high up uh position uh my belt just always sags back down and then it ends up like pulling my pants down and then like <laughs> you know getting asymmetrical in there so i just settle for the hip position but i like that like the high up position better um and then yeah, sometimes it gets a little, little chafy. I have to like, um, make sure, sure I'm wearing like a good shirt, good shorts, it, that things aren't going to fall off the whole time. That is yeah. kind of annoying. Yeah, no, I'm the same. I have to wear it above my hips, especially because that helps getting more depth on the machine too. And then I just have to be sure that I'm pushing my knees out and like not trying to like go too narrow of my stance because then it would just feel like this chafing and oh yeah I, I don't need any more chafing in my life i've got <laughs> that covered it's actually okay so this is this is probably way tmi but we're gonna go there <laughs> just because it's fun so i've lived like my whole life in fitness like with this chafing issue like most men have like once your legs start growing um you get chafing and then eventually it kind of you get used to it and it, it starts stops bothering you quite so much and you find like the right underwears and the right hygiene to kind of manage it so i finally i've gotten it into a good spot on that uh, but then uh in january i started trt 
And one of the side effects of TRT, as many of you might know, is testicular atrophy. And that's something that I also experienced, which is kind of awesome because you go from having like old guy nuts, like I didn't have like huge nuts or anything, but you know, they, as you age, they, they start hanging down and they're in the way a lot of the times. Now I have respectable young man nuts from the TRT, <laughs> which is great. But the problem is, is that it like reinitiated a new cycle of chafing because now they're sitting in a different position than they had been. So yeah. I've been like re like living this like chafe cycle as a result of like starting the TRT uh, a little while ago. So it's been like a funny issue for me. Are you open to talking about the TRT a little bit more? Can I ask questions? I mean, of you course. just gave, yeah. uh, like you said, like the TMI. So uh, that was amazing. Uh, is, can I ask what kind of what led you going in that direction? Was it like health or like, I don't know, yeah, well-being, totally. that sort of thing? So I had, I had known that I had been on the low T side of things for a few years. I had gotten my T checked um, maybe like, I was still living in California at the time. So maybe like four years ago and I was in the like, I think I was in like the 200. So it was like really kind of like at the either I was either like right below the, the normal threshold, which is like either 300 or 250 or something. Anyways, I was right there. I knew I was like on the low side, but didn't really, it wasn't really a priority at the time. And uh, the last couple of years, I just felt like I was training so hard, always doing a pretty good job with my diet. And I'm not like a an unfit person, but I was like, I should be like a jacked guy at this point. Like I should should feel and look like really jacked and i've always been like a big muscular guy um and i was just like something is off because i'm training my balls off and if i have one like off night of dieting it felt like i would just gain a whole bunch of fat like if i had one night where i ate a pizza i would be like fat for the next month and i was just like god this feels weird and then i remembered i was like oh you're kind of low t maybe you should get that checked out again so my t went from low to like abysmally low i think i scored like a 40 on one of my measurements which is like you're basically dying at that point from, from a testosterone standpoint so my uh my my doctor here was just like uh hey you should consider going on trt and i was like oh i've been thinking about that for a while but you know i just kind of put it on the back burner and she was like why don't we go ahead and get started and so it turns out you can do i didn't know this maybe your audience already knows this but um so you can do the traditional like injections which is just you just get testosterone from the pharmacy and you just inject it at home um, or they can do pellets where they actually cut like an incision into your butt and stick like a long, slow, um, dissolving like TRT mm. pellet like into your butt, <laughs> which I didn't even know was a thing. So she was like, do you want the pellet? I was like, let's start with the injections and see how that goes. Um, right. And uh, yeah, so the injections have been great. So I don't have like um, my T is backed into kind of like very much into the normal range. I think the last time I was like 540. Uh, I think the normal range is depending on age and blah, blah, blah. It's usually like 300 to 700 ish. Um, so I'm kind of like back into the, the normal range and it was such an immediate quality of life improvement. I, I really can't recommend it enough for people who were having the low T problem, which I didn't really realize how much it was affecting me until I started using the testosterone and like my mood, uh, was very much stabilized. Like I felt, um, much, much less anxiety day to day. Um, and of course, like the, the physical results, uh, were spoke for themselves too, where I was just immediately started like gaining muscle, losing fat again. And I was like, I started feeling that like, this is how I should have looked this whole time. I find I had that moment where I was like, I train my balls off. I'm really good on the nutrition side. I should like, look like a jacked guy. And now I kind of look like a jacked guy again. And so that, you know, obviously increases your confidence and efficacy and all those things. So for me, it was just like a, a huge win-win, um, especially cause like, I don't have any shame in like, in talking about it. Cause my testosterone was like 40, four zero, like abysmally low. So at that point it was like, well, fuck it. Why not? Let's do it. So it's been a huge yeah. quality of life improvement for me on many different ways, like both like on my psychological and emotional states, but also just on the, my physical body too. I can, yeah, I can definitely imagine. I, uh, not to go too deep into this. I don't know if you know my backstory, uh, like with where Revive Stronger even came, came from the name, uh, for those, those that don't know is long story short, I had a head injury. One of the long-term consequences of that was, uh, uh very low testosterone levels. I got gynecomastia, which I didn't know what didn't that know was. That. Yeah, so I didn't know what it was or anything. I was very nervous, like, and so I got a scan and they're like, hey, this is gynecomastia, got some blood tests done. They're like, hey, your testosterone levels are like super low. They asked me some questions like, when was the last time you had sex or thought about sex or anything like that? And I was like, what is sex? <laughs> I didn't know I hadn't thought about it. And they'd like- It's not uh, even on your mind at that yeah, point, Yeah, exactly. Right? Uh, energy levels, like those sort of things. And 
uh, it was very similar to you. Like I didn't, it was like my new normal was this kind of depressed mopey state of like not feeling great. I also was like training in the gym, trying to gain muscle and just gaining loads of fat at the time that probably contributed to the gynecomastia, I imagine. So yeah, I ended up on TRT and I was taking, I only did like, um, it was less than a year that I was on it to get rid of the gynecomastia and then like normalize my levels. I had a gel that I'd rub into my nipples because that was i guess directly they were trying to like get that down uh but like you said like no seriously this is medicine i'm not just i'm not just doing this for fun they're like be careful not to touch like women with this because yeah they can like absorb it and i was like i'll just not touch my sisters because i'm not that way uh interested although dramatic things happened as soon as i started taking it where like uh for me i don't like i wasn't growing body hair facial hair these sort of things they started coming back um and yeah just quality of well-being and like life day to day it was huge and thankfully i was able to transition off it and sustain normal low levels but yeah i can't imagine people who are living with that and just haven't had like that check to see where they're at so um what was the incentive to to come off of it did it just become like annoying or was it like okay you're in a stable place you don't really need it anymore if you're okay with that so what was that process like for you because like for me like i can't imagine stopping at this point unless yeah. there was a, a pressing reason yeah, mine was I, I wanted to compete in drug free bodybuilding. So I was like, oh, I know I can't I can't on this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it seems obvious when I tell you, but uh, I knew I knew I couldn't whilst I was on it. So I was like, and I got a therapeutic exemption from a couple of federations with like doctor's notes and everything. And I mean, it's over a decade now, like it feels like forever ago. Most people when they go on, like I was told by my doctor, he was like, we can trial coming off, but you're probably going to have to remain on it for like the rest of your life to maintain normal levels. But mine was a weird head injury. So like, maybe it healed they like think i maybe had a bruised pituitary gland or something who knows what happened wow. but yeah i've that's I'm a really still interesting okay. story <laughs> yeah that's crazy so it's, it's funny that we had um very similar uh experiences in that regard because i know it's kind of taboo to talk about in the in the fitness world a yeah. little bit especially like if you're competing like you said um but for me it's just like i got nothing to hide at this point like i don't yeah. give a shit <laughs> if people want to talk about it <laughs> Yeah, to be honest, if I was experiencing the same symptoms and like if I had those low testosterone levels, there's no way like if I hadn't sustained low normal ones afterwards, I would have to have, I would have just gone back on it because it's not a life that you really want to be living long term when you are like feeling all the symptoms yes. of low testosterone. Yeah. And for me, like the only downside is is like I do the injections. And so you, you they just you just do it at home. Like they don't you don't have to go to the office. You just get used to kind of doing it on your own. And that's like slightly annoying, but it's, you, you, you get used to it. The only one that I don't like is the thigh. For whatever reason, like when I do the injection into the thigh, um, I sometimes will hit a, like a nerve um, and I'll get like my, my quad will twitch. Right. And then when you twitch, it kind of just like pew shoots the needle back out and you have, you have to like start over. So for some people that might be like a, a turnoff, right. And, and, and annoying. So for me, I usually do like uh, once I do an injection once a week, I usually do one thigh, then I do the other thigh, then I'll do my butt and then the other butt cheek. Um, and I just kind of alternate there and that seems to work just fine. But I can imagine for other people being like, yeah, I'm tired of doing all these injections. I imagine you also kind of I mean, this is something I've taken from you is like, uh, I've forgotten what the specifics is towards like program design, but it's like basically a risk versus reward type of situation. For me, when I was going on it, I was just like, so out of sorts, like I didn't even, th I didn't, I was so ignorant to any risks that could have been involved. I just thought, hey, my doctors have said do this. But I imagine some people will be thinking, hey, it, it all sounds like amazing. Are there any downsides to going in that direction apart from obviously like not competing in drug tested sports? <laughs> Yeah, well, there is there's definitely one there's kind of like the, 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 the glaring one is that um, although it makes you more um, virile in many ways, it also makes you less potent. So if like if you are trying to have a family, um, that is something that you might hold off on for the time being, because it does tend to for a lot of men will decrease your sperm count, unsurprisingly, especially if you get the testicular atrophy. So it can make like having children a little bit more difficult. And that's, um, that's where the injections can be useful in that like you can stop the injections whenever you decide that you want to maybe pursue family life uh whereas if you get the pellets those are like um i think they they're meant to to release for like five or six months at a time so that can like push your timeline back or um i think you can also start hcg another option for people who want but to be honest i don't i really don't want to go through the the testicle cycle again because when you go through the atrophy phase it, it's it's uncomfortable it's not great some some men are asymptomatic i was symptomatic and as they were atrophying like it's like getting there was 
when it first started, it was kind of like, you know, like when you sit kind of in an uncomfortable position, you pinch your nuts a little bit. It started kind of like that where I was just kind of like, oh, what's going on? Am I, am yeah. I sitting funny? And then it kind of escalated to like kick in the nuts feeling and it would last like all day. And it lasted, and this went on for like two or three weeks where it was like definitely not great. Um, I mean, it was, I'm not trying to say it was like this like horrible, like unbearable pain, but it yeah. was definitely like kick in the nuts kind of feeling. Um, and then it goes away after a while. So that's, those are some downsides that people should consider as well. And there might be some like potential um, health trade-offs when you start to get into the like super um, normal values of testosterone. But for the most part, like if you're using it to get into the normal range and you're, you know, monitoring your, your, your blood levels, liver values, things like that, probably fine. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, cause people ask me about it and I'm like, man, I the, literally the only things I can remember is I started feeling better. Uh, my libido was crazy <laughs> compared to where it was before. Nice. Like that's one thing I could just, I was like, I'm a crazy teenager again and uh, started being able to grow hair again. Like that's all I could remember really. So I-, yeah, <laughs> I It's can't... great, you should do yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> you basically, you feel like a teenager again. That's That would be my like uh, big memory on it. So um, so outside of obviously the sciatica, uh, TRT, which is a fair change. And thank you for talking through that. And I think the TRT helps with my sciatica too, by the way. Oh, I really? Don't, I, don't, I don't think that that's like an unrelated thing. I, I definitely feel like the recovery effects of the TRT. So I, I, I'm, a, I'm making an assumption here, but I assume yeah. that it's probably helping keep that like inflamed uh, tissue down. And I have, I've spoken to some people who they were natural, then went enhanced. And I think they, they probably went slightly assertive at the start of going enhanced, but they've said they literally feel superhuman when they went enhanced. And so from my memory of like, I can't remember what dose of TRT I was on, it was very, very low compared to whatever uh, people take when they're on that, that side of the sport. I can't imagine how they feel like day to day, like people talk about it actually being addicting. And I could see like, if you're not careful, I guess that could be something for some people where if they aren't willing to like moderate it, they don't want the health costs, like they could be an all or nothing person and go, oh, I'll go TRT. And then they go like TRT plus more, and they more, go down more, that route. More, yeah. yeah. Totally, totally. I mean, the first injection I did, no joke, I felt it immediately. Like within like forty minutes, it it felt like I had just chugged an energy drink without <laughs> like not not like the heart palpitation kind of feeling, but just a like oh like that like ramping up feeling. It and I actually messaged um some people who I trust, and I was like, hey, I just did this injection, um, and now I'm like. I'm, I'm feeling like really kind of crazy amped up. Is, is this <laughs> yeah. like, okay, or did I screw up? Um, and they were like, no, this is normal. You're fine. Wow. And then, um, and then once it becomes, you know, routine then you don't really have those like big, big fluctuations anymore. But yeah, the first one, I remember within like 40 minutes, it was like, like literally felt like I was powering up. Like, I don't know if you ever played altered beast, uh, for Sega Genesis back in the day yeah. it was this like very strange game where you, you started off as a scrawny guy and you progressively got more buff and he would go power up and you'd get buffer and buffer and buffer. <laughs> and then you turn into a giant bear. It was very weird. Anyways, that's how it felt where I was just like, I could feel the power like raging. Through me. <laughs> I'm thinking and it does like... make you feel invincible Sorry. in that way. Like I haven't yeah. even taken, um, an active rest phase for like, going on six or seven mesocycles. Every time I think about it, I'm like, you should probably take an active rest or just take like two weeks, just like extend your deload a little bit. I get through the first week of deload and I'm like, there's no reason for me not to be training right now. I should just train. Yeah. <laughs> so you did you find you could handle more volume or progressions were faster, any of those sort of things? Yeah, all of that. All of the above, yeah. yeah. And like the need for the need for the bigger, the bigger ticket recovery strategies definitely goes down and like just kind of the, the deload the deload stuff really just covers like 95% of your training related recovery strategies at that point where it's just like yeah. just deload as much as you know as you feel like you need i guess that's where the saying like the joking sayings goes up the dose like when it's like a coach who's <laughs> right. like coaching an enhanced bodybuilder and they're suffering or whatever it's like eh, another like i don't know whatever 100 milligrams i don't know what numbers it would be so uh, yeah i could see that that becomes unfortunate in many cases where people don't educate themselves they just rely on the, the drugs obviously yeah, you're not sure. doing that <laughs> yeah and like again like it, it, for me it's just more of a health thing so i'm, I'm keeping yeah. it like in the normal range i'm not even like pushing the top end of the normal range i'm just happy to be not where i was before right and um who knows but, but i can i can definitely see where some people would be like oh more is better if 500 is good that means 700 or 800 is even better and maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe there's the trade-offs become more significant at that point. Yeah. 
And with did it impact the diet side at all? Did it make dieting like could you have more calories or anything on 100%. that regard? It felt like I was cheating because like I had always kept pretty tidy with my diet for the most part. And like I said, like I'd have like family come over for a holiday and, you know, have some snacks, have some some off off plan meals. And I would just feel like all of a sudden I just had gained like 20 pounds. I would look like shit. I'd be my my weight would skyrocket and it would take forever to get back to like reasonably lean uh, with a testosterone. Man, like you can just kind of eat. I mean, I still eat well. I still like follow a plan. But yeah, you don't you don't see those wild like deviations like I was seeing before. Like if I have pizza tonight, I'm going to basically be the same as where I was, you know, uh, yesterday. So uh, I do see it's just it's it's not like um, I don't want to paint the picture of like, oh, you can just like fuck off with your diet. But it does kind of give you a little bit more like stability where you don't yeah. see like these huge if you have some cheat meals or deviations here or there. Um, and you just if, for me, it just like you just stay lean uh, much, much more easily. Like you don't have to have 15,000 steps to like maintain a reasonable body composition at that point which is really nice yeah it's really interesting i'm just thinking um, even on uh, potentially of some of my clients who uh, from hearing you talk through this i'm like maybe it'll be i don't know the last time they got their blood blood work done or anything like that it's actually making me leading me to think maybe i should discuss with them to just check it out and see where it's at uh, were there any I've other symptoms talk. Yeah. I've had that talk with a couple of clients just because they you have those people who are seemingly doing everything right. Yeah. And they're just kind of like non responders. And I'm like, hey, just think about it. Yeah. yeah. Were, did, were there any other symptoms you felt that you think other people could like look out for? Yeah. Um, so, and um, this might tie into like a, a bigger discussion, but one of the things that you want to keep out, uh, look out for is kind of your sense of like autonomy. Um, your kind of locus of control and just um, an anxiety level. So just to tie those things together, what you'll start to notice, and this is just like classic fatigue talk, like this is normal for anybody who's like really fatigued, but it just becomes kind of the norm when you have low T. Um, you start to kind of have like, uh, you'll be more prone to being like really, really anxious seemingly out of nowhere even if you're not like an anxious person you'll just notice that things start to affect you where you're like oh my god i'm so worried about this i'm so worried about that or i'm wor this i got this meeting with my boss coming up oh you know just stuff that normally wouldn't really phase you starts to like really start to affect you more um and you start to kind of have these like more like nihilistic type feelings of like you know I don't really have much control of my life. Nothing I do really matters. I'm just kind of like a wash in all these problems that I have no control over. Um, those are classic like overreaching signs that kind of just start to manifest in that low T scenario where you just kind of start to feel like you don't have a lot of sense of agency in your life. You start to feel like things get under your skin. You feel panicky and anxious and more like stressed. And for a lot of men, you can expect to feel like less confident or efficacious in the things that you're doing. Those are things that uh, I think you should definitely like look out for, especially if those are not feelings that you're prone to. Like if, you, if you're not prone to like low confidence or, or anxiety and you start feeling that, and you might not really notice it initially, but it's just one of those things where all of a sudden you start seeing like, oh, my email went from five to 10. Oh my God, I have, I got 10 emails. I got to get, you know, like normally that wouldn't bother you, but now it is that those are the kind of feelings to look out for. And I think with this, I imagine a lot of people, their lifestyle isn't promoting higher testosterone levels. So I don't know, their diet's terrible, like they're not sleeping well, all of those sort of things. Whereas obviously for you, you take care of those variables and that's what made you go like, hey, I'm doing everything right, yet this, I feel this way. So I'm just careful to say to the listeners, like if you're like, I don't know, contest prep and you're feeling this way, it's probably normal. Um, or like, I don't know, you've just been cyclically dieting for too long or like you like you said, overreaching. You want, I imagine you want to assess this at a time where you have some stability in your life, you're taking care of yourself, sleep is good, those sort of things. 100%. And like, I don't want to paint this as like a quick fix to all your problems. This is one of those things where um, you always want to look at like the big recovery strategies first, you know, like how is your training going? How's your nutrition? How's your like sleep hygiene, relaxation hygiene? And, um, you know, what I've been kind of looking at more lately, I just realized, you know, through my own personal experience and just working with clients for a long time, most people can kind of figure out the training side of things. Like you should take deloads or auto regulate your training when you need to. Most people can kind of wrap their brain around that. Most people can wrap their brain around like getting enough protein or maybe biasing your carbohydrate intake here or there or staying hydrated. You tell people that once or twice, they figure it out. 
what most people can't figure out are those lifestyle factors, which is like getting into consistent circadian rhythms with your sleep, your training, your relaxation strategies, your stress management strategies. And so that's where I've been like pivoting a lot of my like kind of attention lately on kind of the stress management side, because I think that's where a lot of people mess up and they, they might reach for something like, oh, I should get on TRT. Um, and that might kind of help. Certainly it'll, it'll make you feel better. But the problem is, is that you haven't developed kind of the systems, the thought processes, the routines of how to deal with like stressors or how to allow yourself to have relaxation time throughout the day, for an example. And those are the things that are going to carry you, whether you're enhanced or unenhanced. Like those are the things that you need to learn how to do one way or another and are probably one of the biggest limiting factors to your recovery ability and your therefore ability to perform or make gains in the long term. So in my experience, you know, like I can tell somebody like, hey, you should deload every, you know, once every couple handful of weeks. Okay, no problem. Hey, like, let's talk about stress management. And they're just like, they have no concept of like what that even means or entails because frankly like a lot of the stuff that we're told is nonsense um like the classic one that you hear all the time is like okay you want to get better at managing your stressors you gotta you know some some iteration of you need to learn how to control your emotions well guess what you don't really have much control over that now do we right our emotions are kind of just these fleeting states of our psyche that are a result of biochemical responses to things that we interact with in our environment right so one of the things I've been like really big on lately is like, you can't really control your emotions. Your emotions kind of come and go. They're largely outside of your locus of control. But what you can control are the behaviors that you adopt throughout the day to either get yourself back on track, to stay productive with whatever it is that you're doing and not allow yourself to kind of get into these just unsustainable, like psychological, emotional states. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. The saying I always remember, I don't even know where it's from now, but it's like stress is stress is stress. Like the body just, it, it doesn't matter if it's work stress, life stress, your kids, like bad sleep, diet, training, like the body responds in a similar way. It all accumulates and adds up and is going to have an impact on your ability to be a healthy and feeling good person, being able to perform and everything. So, um, Dude, 100%. There's so many different psychosomatic effects. And that's one of those things where like you might, um, I've had clients like this too, where they're doing they're doing everything right, but like their work schedule is crazy or they have uh, like a death in the family or, you know, their, 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 their child care situation has changed because of COVID, you know, and now they have to like take care of their kids instead of like what they were doing before. Right. And all of these different stressors add up and they're like, I think the, the problem is my training. <laughs> it's like your training's fine. The, the reason your training is maybe not going as well is because you have all these other stressors that are adding up and they're just taking their toll on you. And maybe you're not like dealing with them as effectively as you could. That I think is like where a lot of people fall apart in like a good training regimen is that that like i said that relaxation stress management type hygiene is really important do you not see the progress you would like are you sick of writing your own programs or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with a plan then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We create the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. One of these, I know uh, this is like the, the core of the discussion or why I wanted to bring you on today, because to me, you're the recovery guy. And I know you said you've been pivoting your thoughts a little bit on recovery and things like this. And one of them you talked about was this kind of remove yourself strategy. And there was like a number of steps uh, involved with this. I'd love to kind of hear a bit more about that. Yeah. So this this might be a little bit long winded. I apologize in advance. Um, so like I kind of in my in my brain, um, I think about like relaxation and stress management as kind of like two separate but like overlapping things where on the relaxation side of things we're deliberately trying to get our physical and mental states from like aroused to more basal just kind of like back to normal 
Stress management, on the other hand, is a little bit different in that it kind of revolves around developing resiliency or even like robustness to encountering stressors and pivoting your behaviors in such a way that kind of promotes autonomy and or like productivity. So I've been looking at a lot of different things and it, I feel like it almost feels silly to talk about some of this stuff at times because like one of the things that I've learned with the stress management side of things is this idea of mindfulness practice. And I know mindfulness is like kind of post pandemic became this like hot buzzword and it's kind of this kind of has this like kind of hippy dippy foo foo um, connotation to it. But really um, the idea of mindfulness is kind of the infrastructure in which stress management works because you need to have the ability to introspect your, phys your physical, but also your psychological and emotional states. You have to be able to kind of like disconnect a little bit or even like dive into further, like what it is you're actually experiencing, what it is you're feeling, whether it's good or bad or, you know, somewhere in the middle. And I find that that is something that people really have no concept of because a lot of the, the ideas with the stress management stuff is kind of like deflect or like get this away from me because it's bothering me or let me like redirect my attention to something else. Let me distract myself from this, these things, whether, whether it's like an incident or an emotion that you're feeling or something happened, whatever it is, you're kind of drawing your attention away from that. And really with stress management, some of the best strategies seem to be actually drawing your attention directly to it. So like when you are feeling, I'm going to use this term broadly, but like, let's just say you're feeling some kind of pain, whether it's physical pain, emotional pain, psychological pain, this could be like anxiety, loneliness, frustration, just using this term broadly, some kind of like negative thought we might describe as pain. Most of the stuff you'll read online will say like, just kind of push the pain over to the side and keep working on whatever it is that you can work on. The reality is you don't want to run away from the pain. You actually want to run to the pain and you want to experience that pain fully and introspect about like what it is that I'm experiencing. Why did it come about? What were the series of events that led to this? You know, like, can I make some mental notes about like how I got here? And then you can actually start working your way through some of these feelings using a variety of tools like cognitive behavioral therapy is a really good example of one. Um, and even some of the simple ones like that one I posted the other day, which was, you know, remove yourself. It's one of the first like simple things you can do. So uh, in that example, it's something that I have been kind of looking at in a variety of different contexts. When you're kind of in a moment, it could be like you're dealing with somebody and you're finding yourself becoming like increasingly frustrated. You might be having your feelings kind of coming to a boiling point, whether it's like anger or sadness, et cetera. It could be any, any variety of feelings or emotions, right? Um, actually just kind of literally and figuratively distancing yourself from whatever it is that's going on is generally a really good first step in terms of getting yourself back to a state where you can make good decisions about whatever it is that you're doing at that moment. And so one of the things I always say is, you know, start by removing yourself. This might mean just like, if I'm having a bad interaction with you, I might just Say, hey, Steve, I need a couple minutes. Can you just give me a sec? I'm going to come right back. And I might just walk over to the other room, take a couple breaths, think about like what it is that's affecting me, what it is that, you know, triggered me to feel a certain way. Like what were the series of events that led to that? Maybe you said something that I didn't like, or maybe I can then start like piecemealing my way through. Like maybe Steve said something that I didn't like. But also maybe like I'm taking an affront to something that he didn't mean it in a certain way. Like maybe I can steal man Steve's case. He didn't he didn't necessarily mean mean it to come off a certain way. Maybe it didn't this or that. And you can kind of start just immediately working through a few of these processes and then kind of refocusing and reframing your goal. So like I'm I'm interacting with Steve today. I'm in a moment where I'm hitting this boiling point. Like, what is my goal for this interaction with Steve? What am I trying to do? And that could be just to like have a really fun, engaging podcast. It could be like we have some work to get through, whatever it is, right? So reframing that goal, like I'm upset with Steve for some reason right now. Uh, my goal is to get through this meeting so I can we can work on our projects together. What are the, the strategies or behaviors that I need to imbibe just to make sure that this goes productively? And then kind of sitting on that for a minute or two. And this might be like like this, right? Some people are really good at this and they can go through this whole process in like a minute. Other people might actually take them like a day or two to work through this, right? But the idea being like introspect, feel the feelings fully, think about how you got there, think about like what you want to accomplish and then work your way back to whatever situation that you are dealing with. A really good example of, this is something I do all the time with emails. Sometimes I'll get an email and I'm like, ooh, ooh, you motherfucker. Oh, I am like not, and I am not pleased with this. And I'll start like immediately start typing, right? And then I find myself 
hitting that boiling point a little bit where I go, you know what, let me just, I'll mark it, I'll delete the email, mark it as unread, go do something else for a little while. And then subconsciously, a lot of those processes will already start kind of un unraveling a little bit and you don't even have to necessarily be actively engaging with it. But then I, I try to also actively engage with it and think about like, okay, why are you mad? Oh, this client thinks they know more than I do and they wanna like do the X, Y, or Z. Um, oh, okay, well just remember like, hey, they have opinions too, and maybe they have some experiences and, you know, it's okay for them to assert what they, what they like, you know, you, you, you can kind of maybe try and find a way to meet them in the middle, build good rapport. And then when I feel like I can approach the email or whatever it is in a productive way again, then I will re-engage with it. And I think that's something that we all kind of do. And you see people who are like masters of this. Like, I don't know if you've ever been like in a work meeting with other people. And uh, I've seen people do this where they're just like, Hey guys, I need like a minute. And they'll just kind of like, do their little like deep breath woosah for a second and they're back and they're like, okay, here's what we're going to do. Right. Some people are really excellent and they've probably practiced doing some of these things a lot. Right. And they become like very good at identifying their mood states, working their way through it, kind of using things like CBT strategies or taking walks, breathing strategies, et cetera. And it's really impressive. You don't necessarily notice it, but then once you become aware of what people are doing, like I see people do this like in a second and I'm like, oh, that guy is the man. Like they've, they've practiced this. This is some, this is not like new to them. Um, and so there's a lot of different things you can do. And that's just like one simple one is kind of like start by removing yourself either literally or figuratively from a situation that is bothering you. Take some breaths, draw your attention to the feelings, not away. Like, don't distract yourself. Say, okay, I'm going to go play Diablo 4 for a couple hours, right? Like, sit on it, feel it. What is actually going on? Go towards the pain. Don't run away from the pain. That's usually kind of one of the first steps. Yeah, yeah I really like that because, yeah, I've that email scenario works perfectly if, I don't know, something's triggered me on social media or something else like that. And uh, even I might end up writing a response and then just being like, hey, I, that was felt good to write it, but I don't need to send that. Let's hold it back. Let's come back with a more reasonable, rational kind of thought process. And some of what you're speaking about here is um, something that you may have even experienced it on some of the diets where you've got like very lean. Like I experience it every time I compete. I'm like, I feel like a different person. I get pissed off way easier. Like oh, I'm just yeah. So irritable. So I have to always find myself like taking a breather, like take, take myself back. Uh, and actually, it's funny, I always thought like removing yourself from maybe an argumentative situation was not ideal because it's like, hey, you're just like leaving it. But I think the key difference here is you mentioned you're not just leaving and disengaging with that. You're actually leaving, engaging with it and coming back with something which I think is important. Yeah. And you can do it in like a polite, respectful way too. Like, I think it's rude if you're having a disagreement with somebody like your spouse or colleague and you're just like, you just walk out on them because then they're yeah. sitting there and they're like, what the fuck? Right. But I think you can do it in a way that's just like, Hey, you know what? I feel myself kind of going in a direction. I don't want to go. Just give me, give me a few minutes and I'll come back and we'll, we'll wrap this up. I'm sorry. If you wouldn't mind, if you just, you know, entertain me for a second, I just need to like, think on this for a second you know there's you can phrase that however you like but there's polite ways to do it um and i think people appreciate it you just don't want them to like leave them feeling like you're just walking out and dismissing them because you you're you're pissed off you can you can say like hey i feel myself getting a little upset or i'm getting a little yeah. angry i, I kind of want to come back to this when i'm a little cool down and most people will go okay yes yeah. yeah. that makes tons of sense is there anything obviously this is something that is more of a something to be aware of and use in acute situations where you feel it kind of occurring. Is there anything you encourage people to do on like a, a daily basis to try and manage their emotions better? I'd obviously, um, like there's lots of meditation apps and things that have become popular. Is there anything you personally use or maybe it's walks or something else? Yeah, there's actually a couple. So um, like uh, the mindfulness practice is something, and I know, I know people might be eye rolling me right now going like, oh, you're going down that road. It really is beneficial. It's one of those things. It's, um, it's actually a very frustrating thing to do if you've never, I mean, so when we're talking about mindfulness practice, we're not talking about just like kind of like the, re, uh, the meditations you can download off of, you know, Audible or Spotify. These are practices that are meant to help their, excuse me, their, their exercises that are meant for you to practice drawing your attention to and away from certain things. They could be towards like physical sensations in your body. They could be towards like mood states. They could be towards like particular sensory experiences like your sight, your taste, your hearing, your smells. Um, and what you find is that when you actually really give these things a try, part of the process is actually failing over and over and over again at these exercises, which for a lot of people, they find it frustrating because they want to think that they're winning, but it's actually the failing and the bringing yourself back 
into these exercises that work. So here's a common example. You might do a mindfulness meditation that is to like focus on the sensations of breathing. That's usually like a very beginner friendly one. You feel like the inspiration, the expiration, like just, just focus your attention on that and just do that for, you know, for however long it might be a five, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever. Inevitably, what you what will happen is your attention will just deviate to something else. Like your mind starts to wander. Um, and then you go, oh, fuck, I'm supposed to be like thinking about this breathing exercise. But the point of the exercise itself is to notice that your mind and your thoughts and your feelings kind of just come and go in these different ways and finding yourself um, catching it in the moment and then being able to redirect your attention back to whatever it is that you're doing. I know how corny that might sound, but that practice is kind of like, like I said, the infrastructure of stress management, of being able to like introspect on your physical, emotional states, see where your attention is currently, and then actually redirecting your attention maybe towards something else that might be a better use of your time or behavior, right? And so I think that is like a very good thing, maybe not like daily, but like definitely should be like something people do pretty regularly. like. I, I highly recommend it. There's some there's some really simple ones like Sam Harris has uh, the Waking Up app and has a really good like beginner onboarding program. Um, and then you can do more advanced ones as you go. But I think that's a really good one um, for people to just build up that ability because I think it's not that you need to like think of like becoming like a Zen Buddhist monk, right? The idea is like, can I get better at identifying my own states of being, like my own mental, emotional, physical states of being? Can I get better at doing that? That's the point, right? And then there's some other things we can definitely do. Um, taking walks is actually one of the most well-documented, like researched mood stabilizing things you can do. And a very little bit goes a long way. And so if you find yourself kind of in a stressful situation or you feel stress kind of like building up, um, something like a 15 to 20 minute, it doesn't even have to be that fast. Like they, usually, they often will just say like a brisk walk consistently has a mood like stabilizing or even like uh, affect building effect where if you just want to like feel better, just going out and doing some very light walking um, is a really great way of like a quick fix. Uh, that can also be paired. Um, there's, um, I forgot what the Japanese um, name for this, but there's a really good body of literature coming out of Japan that I, I believe is loosely translated to forest breathing. There's a, obviously a Japanese mm -hmm. word for that. But the short version is that like um, actually spending time in a natural setting and doesn't even have to be like a national park or anything crazy, but like just spending some time where you can soak in a little bit of like the beauty of the natural world does seem to have like effects on your blood pressure, heart rate, sympathetic nervous system activity. It has this like very relaxation um, stimulating effect. So very often like a simple thing might be to take like a 15 to 20 minute walk in somewhere where you can observe like even just in like in a park or if you if you work in like an office building complex, sometimes they'll have like a feature like a pond or some some forests or, you know, like some treat area, forested areas. Um, doing something like that and actually just spending some time in a natural setting can have like a mood enhancing or stabilizing effect. So those are some like really just simple ones. Um, and then another thing to consider that I, I, I have a hard time with this one because I have a love hate relationship with this one in particular, but, um, this idea of developing, um, toughness, you might call toughness training is something that is something that people should try to do. There's a really great book that I highly recommend. It's called Do Hard Things that talks about this in great detail. Um, but actually presenting yourself with challenging situations and accustomizing yourself to the discomfort of all these different things, whether they're social interactions, um, psych, you know, mentally challenging things, physically challenging things, doing them voluntarily helps build a lot of resiliency to stress. And so all of yourself, all of your listeners, I'm sure are, are all doing rigorous training already, right? And training is like a great manifestation of that. Why? Because training fucking sucks. You get tired, it's painful, it's a big fuss, and you have to be in, like, um, I actually just had a uh, talk with a client who emailed me and they were like, is it okay? Like, uh, they said they um, the pump was so bad on a certain exercise they were doing, they didn't hit their RIR goal because they had to stop because it was so painful, right? Boom, exactly exactly what I'm getting at here, right? This is itself a mindfulness type activity because in that moment, you are experiencing a lot of discomfort. Like when you get a really bad pump going and you have like a high rep, like let's say cable curls is one for me, where like if I'm doing like 20 reps on a cable curl, it fucking hurts, right? Um, and you have to be like in that moment saying like, oh man, this really sucks but you're just taking in that pain, you're feeling it, you're experiencing it, and you're voluntarily saying like, I'm gonna push through this 
to this point, right? That's a really great example of this idea of like toughness and building resiliency to stress. So training is like the manifestation of that. We just do it because it, obviously it aligns with our like body composition and sport goals. But in those moments, you're often faced with something that's very uncomfortable. You have the opportunity to quit, but it's like right within that your, your ability zone. It's right within your zone to manage it and you voluntarily choose to persevere through it. And so there are a number of different like versions of that. Um, I think the problem with that idea of toughness training is it gets bastardized into like stupid coach derp stuff where they they make their athletes run suicides and stairs and do all this like yep. crazy, crazy wild stuff. So, you know, this type of training doesn't necessarily need to be like physical. It can be very simple. It could actually be like one example that I, I can cite is like, if you are like an introverted type person, you might use a toughness exercise of just striking up like a 30 to 60 second conversation with somebody at your coffee shop. Sounds horrendous. <laughs> it's exactly, right? The key is like yeah. you're putting, you're, you're feeling that discomfort, but you're voluntarily choosing to like persevere through it. And by doing so, you become more accustomed to the discomfort and you also build the confidence and efficacy of like working your way through some of those tough situations. And that ties into our stress management idea because like when you have gone through very difficult things, it builds up your resiliency and it makes you more robust. It actually makes you better at dealing with those things, not just deflecting them, not just saying like, okay, I'm not going to let this bother me. You go, no, I am letting this bother me, but I actually can keep my head in this situation because I have practiced and done this before. And so I think those are some like really good yeah. kind of ones to imbibe in your daily life. I really like those and I can totally see in this day and age how some of them are, have become hard to do where people just end up like just skipping over a lot of them or if, again if you live in a big city and you don't consider i don't know you get ubers everywhere and you're not spending any time in nature and everything like that uh i think headspace was one i used for a short period of time similar to sam harris's one yeah yeah there's a there's a bunch of, you don't have to yeah. do the, the sam's one I, that's just one i had more experience with there's a bunch of really good ones and the, the key too is to like remember on a lot of those, like the point is to become aware of your, your states and aware of how you're like focusing your attention, right? And that is like, I can't stress enough, that is like the root of stress management because what do most people do? When they start feeling negative emotions or negative thoughts, they fixate on those negative thoughts and it becomes this like positive feedback loop of like, these things are making you stressed and the stress is making you more anxious or angry. And then you see this like big positive feedback loop. Whereas like, if you're able to like identify and say like, my attention is here, why is it here? Right. And, and part of mindfulness training too, is just also identifying that like the feelings that you're feeling are fleeting. They come and go, right. You can sit there and say like, Oh, hot damn. I am really anxious right now. Like what's going on. And you know that like, you know, it's only a matter of minutes before that's going to go away or at least largely go away and you'll kind of be back to normal. It's not going to be days, weeks, years of feeling anxious. It's I feel anxious right now and it sucks right now, but it's probably not going to be that much longer. I can probably like kind of maybe sit on this, take it in, think about like where it's coming from and then try to see like what direction I can go right now so that I'm still on track with whatever it is that I'm doing. It might be training, it might be your job, it might be your family life, whatever. Can I be the best athlete? Can I be the best employee? Can I be the best husband, spouse, father, mother, whatever, in the moment right now, despite having these feelings? And that's where the, that practice really comes in. Yeah, I I can totally see that. And um, the bicep curl example, uh, I was thinking of leg extensions. That's the one oh, where I always yeah. see people give out before they should. I'm like, no, nah, if it's burning, now you have four more or something, <laughs> six more. Dr. Mike has the gnarliest leg extension machine I have ever used. And I never really think much about leg extension machines because they're mostly a dime a dozen. The one at Dr. Mike's like mega gym was the most crippling leg extension I have ever used. I wish I could remember what, what it, it was off the top of my head. It's not a prime I, one. I, I, even if it was, I don't know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't remember, but I remember just like, okay, I'm going to hit some knee extensions today when I was over there training. And then I was just like completely wrecked because I was doing mile reps too. So just, Ow. oh, it destroyed me. Yeah, it was brutal. But yeah, um, uh, <laughs> it is it is a good example of like something that you manifest through training where you're like, you, you learn how to work through physical discomfort. And I think like that process can be applied to like emotional or psychological discomfort as well. Yeah, it almost sounds a little bit like exposure therapy in some way, 
when when you were kind of talking me through i was like ah yeah like just slowly gradually exposing yourself to things that you find stressful almost yeah and uh, and i don't want to make it sound like you should go and like go you know uh, uh, parachute jumping or anything like crazy sure. necessarily <laughs> like that it should it should be kind of um uh, the, the the psychological phrasing is usually the zone of proximal development, which means it's like right on the cusp of what you are capable of doing, right? So there's like your comfort zone, there's like the outside of your comfort zone, right? So it's like right on that edge of like, you can do it, you have to try, but you can do it. What you don't want to do is present yourself with challenges that are outside of your ability, because inevitably, you will fail, uh, by definition, because they're outside of your ability, right? And what does that cause? Well, that just causes like the, the negative feedback, or, excuse me, the positive feedback loop of negative feelings of like losing confidence, losing efficacy. I'm not, I'm not good at this kind of stuff. I suck. I shouldn't even try nihilism. It goes from there. Right. So yeah. the key is finding like those kind of baby steps, bite sized things that you can manage rather than taking on this like, <laughs> I'm not trying to like poo poo on anybody, but like a lot of people who get into fitness, one of the goals that they set right away is like, I want to run a marathon right? Are you in one of the, I, I, I don't say this out loud, but one of the questions that goes through my mind when somebody says that to me, if I get a client, they're like, I want to run a marathon. I'm like, can you even stand for five or six hours currently, let alone like jog or run, right? Like that is just not in our ability zone. That is way outside of our abilities. It doesn't mean you can't get there down the road, but it's my, it's going to take a while. What's something that we can like do right now? Like, can we do you know, 20 minutes of cardio two times a week. Now that seems like something we can do. Same idea, right? And then you you, you find these challenges that are manageable. Um, even something silly like I know I know if people listen to like Joe Rogan, they're gonna eye roll here. But even something like sitting in an ice bath for like a minute or two. If you've never done it before, it's fucking terrible. And uh, like I am, I can't do it. I I'm terrible at it. So it might be like okay, cold just showers. sit in here for a cold shower. Yeah, exactly. So anything along those lines. Just sit in there for like thirty seconds, and you might have like peers and teammates or whomever who can do it for like five minutes, right? Well, their ability for that particular stress is just a little more. Um, uh, practice and refine than yours and that's okay but you want to scale it to like that individual level like what is this person able to do um and it, it can be kind of fun um the only the only the only drawback i would say is you don't want to like pick these things that are going to be so stressful that they're going to like really have a big impact on your training ability so if you if you choose an activity that is yeah. just like that, that wrecks you um and now you can't train for a week that might be a little bit like overkill just for the purposes of the exercise yeah, I, I can imagine there's some that are complementary, whereas there's some that are directly like, like going to be interfering. Like I don't know, someone wants to pick up cardio because they just absolutely suck at it, and then they start incorporating all these sprints or something outside of their resistance training. It's like ah, that's probably not a good move. <laughs> right, and that might be good to think of like more fun, um, like emotional or like psychological strategies yeah. that they can implement as well. Because I like I'm sure you've dealt with people who are like they their, their tolerance to discomfort whether it's physical discomfort or anything is very low. I, I have a client uh, right now who doesn't want to go to the gym because they don't feel confident enough to go to the gym. And that's fine. A lot of people feel that way. Right. And so that's like something where you might start exploring that option in, in little teeny tiny bite size exposures. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense. The only question I had follow up was the one getting into like um, nature and mm -hmm. kind of experiencing that, which I, I think everyone listening, if you ever go to like, I don't know, you go to a, a park or you go to like, um, what am I trying to say? A forest or you see like an amazing waterfall or any of that. Like I love it or like just a, a big span of water or a lake. I, I, I absolutely love all of that. And it's hard to come by in London, unfortunately, especially in walking sure. distance or anything. Um, but I always enjoy kind of go for a walk in the park every day. Uh, with that, is there anything, have you ever looked into, and it, it kind of did the circuits of a number of maybe years ago, even grounding where you're kind of barefoot. And I think it's to do with like, I don't know, the earth taking out negative. Uh, I don't know. What even, <laughs> I don't even know the science or any of that. I don't know if you've ever looked into grounding. I'm not going to try and talk anything about it. <laughs> not, not specifically. Uh, I have seen it a little bit, but I, never, I haven't really done like a good, a good dive on it. I think it's kind of the means to the same end where you're kind of getting better at um, like if you're if the, if the focus is like okay bare feet on the ground like you're drawing your attention to the sensations of like your feet 
which is in itself like a mindfulness exercise, right? Where you're actually focusing on like, how does this actually feel? Like, can I, am I developing this kind of like sense of connection with the ground and the way that I'm ambulating or sitting or whatever? And I think it's also kind of pairs with some of those um, like kind of ideas of like being in, the, in, in a natural setting. So it's probably kind of like a means to the same kind of ends. And a lot of the times you find that these strategies kind of funnel into these like simple ideas like um, spend time relaxing, spend time in nature, um, mindfulness training. And a lot of the kind of kitschy, um, trendy stuff are just like exercises or ways to kind of get there in a, in a like a less like formal way, right? Like, um, I don't know, like, uh, like massage is a good example, like um, therapy. Right, therapeutic touch, or like, what's probably the biggest benefit of massage? Well, you just sit there and relax for an hour, and it feels good. Like, so the massage is like an avenue towards promoting like that relaxation state um, that people can just like adopt very easily, rather than saying like, okay, I have this like nineteen-year-old athlete who I'm working with. I want you to just like sit around and do nothing for two hours. Good luck, right? They're immediately going to devolve into chasing tail or whatever they whatever they want to do, right? Whereas like, if you give them an activity that facilitates the end goal very often even if even if the activity is you know my eye roll at the activity a little bit it's still probably better because it gets them to the desired goal which is like relaxation stress management mindfulness etc fantastic uh james on this have you got anything that you're working on kind of as a product or like a, is there a, a book coming out or anything like that are you, or are you currently working on anything else not a ton right now i'm just doing a ton of coaching which has been great um you know I've been doing the the uh, search stuff which has been really fun um and yeah, not really. I'm kind of just like organizing a lot of my thoughts on this because it's it is kind of scatterbrained in many ways. Because you kind of, especially on the stress management side, you, you you there's like a lot of scientific stuff, but then there's kind of like a lot of um, I don't know, like countercultural stuff, which does seem to like have a significant degree of overlap. So it, it can be kind of difficult to organize those two spaces in like a, a practical and meaningful way. So right now I'm mostly just kind of working on some of that stuff, just getting my thoughts down and trying to figure it out. I still am working on my uh, sport training book forever. It just keeps getting put on the back burner for other things right now. Um, so yeah, mostly just doing a lot of coaching. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Actually, a question I, or I was going to ask you about it was I know, well, because um, I noticed at least I wasn't sure if there was something um, coming out because you ended up coming on social media a little bit more, which I appreciate uh, when I see spurts of your training and everything. But I think it was mostly related to because you started using the hypertrophy app, which I was going to just oh, ask yeah. very briefly about it, because I'm sure the listeners are more than aware of the RP hypertrophy app that came out. Um, I'm sure most of them have bought like the scientific principles to um, hypertrophy training, everything like that, the RP diet 2.0. So I, no doubt the audience are interested in this. And um, basically just wanted to know your experience with it. Like, and uh, what I'm personally very interested in is, was there anything it did differently to how you were already going about it? Because obviously it's already putting a lot of the things you know into, but it's going at like, I don't know, it might give you an extra set where you would have like been like, nah, I'm not doing another one there. Or it might make you do things that you wouldn't have otherwise made yourself do. Yeah, yeah, those are great questions. So I was on the like early, uh, like the internal version of the app before we released it to the public. So we, it was like working through a lot of the initial kinks and like giving a lot of feedback about like my my experience using it. And so it's gone through like all of these different iterations. Uh, and we eventually re had like the beta release and then the public release. So it's gone through like multiple, multiple iterations and gotten so much good feedback from everybody. So what the app does like really well is it does from from a hypertrophy standpoint, it really pushes up your volume. It does not beat around the bush. Like it gets you into that like hard training. And uh, I know you'll, you'll share maybe the same sentiment, but like most people, their impression of like hard training might be like three sets of this exercise, three sets of that exercise. Okay, I did a little bit of chest. I did an incline chest. I did some triceps. And I'm calling it a day, right? The RP training app makes sure that like even within your recovery abilities, you are pushing the boundaries of how much training tolerance that you can handle. And so that's probably going to be the first thing people notice is that like, wow, this is making me do a lot of sets. And um, the reason why that's interesting is because for people who are having that experience, it's more um, of an eye-opening experience in that you have probably been chronically under training 
relative to your own abilities for a while. So the RP app is like, we're not having any of that. You, we're going to push you right up to that like MAV, MRV zone, like pretty close to right away. Like it, start, it, it eases you in, but then like by week two, it's like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Um, the other thing that I think it does a really good job of, well, two more things actually. It has a, a really nice rep estimator um, tool where the first week you kind of, you pick the weight that you're using, you put in how many reps you got, and it basically starts doing some internal math on its own about like how many reps you should be getting and like changing the weights at the same time. So it might increase your weight and it will give you a rep match recommendation where it's like, okay, you did 15 last time, we're going to increase the weight a little bit and we're going to do a slightly harder RIR. So you should get 16 or whatever it is this time. Um, and it, that number is like spot on. It always impresses me how good it is. And you can even change the weight to a certain degree and it will change the corresponding rep goal, um, which oh, is cool. really nice. So you might have done like 185 uh, for a set of 10 last time. You may, you might change it and go 175 this time and it will say, okay, well, this time you should probably get 12, right? Something along those lines. And the numbers it uses are really, really spot on. It always impresses me um, how close it is to like what I, what my perception of what it should be is. And then the other thing that I think it does a really great job of is making sure that you're you're, you are pushing the weights up a little bit consistently, ev um, not every time, but consistently week to week. So like uh, for a lot of my programs, when I write for people, like I do like pre-planned weight increases, but we kind of do a lot of auto regulation too, where I say like, okay, you don't, you should probably go up here, but if you're, if you're still kind of in the mid of the goal reps range, maybe don't or whatever. Um, the RP app is like, keep that weight coming, like add a little bit more weight, add a little bit more. Weight. Even when you think like, nah, I don't know if I want to add a little bit more weight. Uh, it, it makes sure that you are still increasing both the sets and the intensity to a lesser extent. So I think that's kind of like the big, the big um, sell with the app is like, it gets you into that, like really hard training and it might change your perception of like what hard training means for you. And it does a really good job of tracking your performance and making sure that like, if you do start hitting that wall, whether it's like a, a local MRV or systemic fatigue and your performance starts dropping, you pop in whatever you got and it does a really good job of helping you manage that. But most people, the first thing they'll know, they, they, most people don't get, get quite there because they have been under training for so long that the, the increase in the workloads, they just start seeing like gains, 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 gains. And you're like, wow, the app is magic. Um, yes and no, it's just getting you up into that like MAV zone that you had been avoiding for so long. So I think that's that's probably like one of the biggest features. And it also forces you to think about um, like how much pump you're getting, joint soreness. It, it has a lot of prompts that you have to kind of input as you're training. Yeah. And a lot of people are just not really conscious of like joint pain or how much pump they're feeling on a given muscle group. And so it kind of forces you to introspect a little bit more about what it is you're actually doing. Yeah, I really like that because um, when I saw some of the, the images being shared and then I've dug into the app a little bit, it's some of the stuff I've been like trying, like it's things I educate my clients on so they can make those adjustments kind of through the mesocycle and like it's stuff I've had to educate myself on. But it's great because I think it expedites that process for a lot of people who are a bit unsure, maybe. Whereas, and they can essentially almost not switch off, but they can like trust the app. They just like fill out a questionnaire or whatever it is, the, the forms, and then it's going to give them kind of what they need. And again, the algorithm should work out if it's like you said, if they've overdone it or whatever, it will start soon sorting them out there. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. It really takes a lot of the guesswork out where you just say, like, okay, the app's telling me to do this. I'm just going to go for it. And so far, I haven't had like anything where I was like, wow, that was way off, right? Like, and the thing too, with like the hypertrophy training, like we talked about earlier in the episode today, is pretty forgiving, right? So like, um, unless you're seeing like a humongous, like fatigue related drop off, like even if like your reps, you know, maybe if the weight goes up, a, you know, a weight increment and your reps go down a little bit, like that's still productive training. So long as like, you're not seeing these humongous, you know, like 40, 50% drop offs in your performance week to week. So the app does a really good job of gauging those things. And um, one of the features that I think you might, we were, we were kind of talking about earlier, um, you can like add in custom exercises too. So it has like a big list of just kind of stock exercises and technique videos. But if you do something kind of different where you like, okay, I actually do like this reverse grip on this curl or this tricep extension, you can just add a new exercise and say, okay, this new exercise goes in the category of 
triceps. Okay, what's the name? Put in the name and they're building a big database of these customized exercises. And I think at some point they're hoping to um, do uh, videos for those as well once they get like a lot of feedback from everybody else. So if they see like, okay, here's this like interesting sissy squat note that somebody made. Oh, okay, let's actually include that when we do these big video updates later on. So uh, it's really flexible. Like you can, you can put, you can, you can have it just make something for you that's kind of stock, or you can say, no, I'm a little bit more particular. I want to make sure it's done this way. You can do it customized as well. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, and I'll make sure we've got kind of information in the description about that so people can check that out. And uh, James, I just want to say a massive thank you again for taking the time to come on. It's always great chatting to you. And uh, I'll make sure to link your description, sorry, link your uh, Instagram in the bio as well, because that's uh, where I know you keep like a lot of your training and everything going along. And that's where you've been kind of documenting using the app and everything. Is there anywhere else people should head if they want to kind of see more from yourself? Yeah, thanks so much for having me on again. It's always a blast to talk to you. I'm trying to be less of a hermit, trying to get out there a little bit more. So uh, I'm at, at RP Dr. James on Instagram. That's the main one I use. I've been dabbling with like threads a little bit. I still am like awkward on threads. Um, so I'm mainly, <laughs> mainly using Instagram. Uh, and that's usually where you can find me. Um, so that, that's probably the best place. I feel on threads, someone, I made a thread and someone messaged me. I was like, oh, I heard everyone left threads already. I was like, it's only been out a few months. How have people already left it? So I don't even know what's happening over there. I'm just like, I, know. I use it as a brain dump. <laughs> I'm so terrible at social media. I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> so guys, definitely make sure to follow James, pressure him uh, to be better on social media and we'll talk to you soon. Take care. All right, thanks again. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it and we will help you achieve this. The Mini Cup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cut so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cut movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.